Hi everyone, this is the video that goes with chapter 14, um, the chapter on behaviorism. Um, so learning theories applied to personality, which um, to me seems like sort of an odd fit. So as you're reading the chapter, I would encourage you to read it relatively quickly um, and just sort of keep going, motor all the way through so that you're aware of what's in it. Um, but I would say I don't consider it one of the dominant theories in personality psychology. So um, I think uh, this video is going to be fairly short, and I think our treatment of this um, chapter should be correspondingly short. Um, behaviorism, as you probably remember from your introductory psychology class, is a theory of everything, right? It's, it's how everybody developed. It's as though we were a blank slate when we were born and that we were conditioned um, through rewards and punishments, through, um, through the shaping of our behavior across our whole life. So it denies any form of free will. It suggests that um, if I knew your conditioning history, I would be able to predict with absolute accuracy everything that you would do. And so in that sense, is that really your personality? I'm predicting your behavior, um, but we've been talking about personality as though it's a separate thing and not just something that you do, but it's more something that you have. So um, I would encourage you to keep that in mind as you're reading through this chapter. Um, you know, I don't, uh, you know, I don't, you know, be, the behaviorists thought that everybody should be studied from the outside. If you couldn't observe it, it didn't exist. Um, they were not at all concerned with what was going on in the inside, unconscious motivations, that kind of thing. Um, they really just thought observable behavior was where we should be locating all of our scientific research. You know, I will say that um, they did contribute a lot to the science of psychology um, and the idea that we should be able to quantify things and measure it and use empirical data. Um, on the other hand, there are some things that we know that can't be uh, measured. There's a biology of personality that can't be measured. And I think the behaviorist view that you are a product of your conditioning history uh, forgets what we learned in the biological chapter, which is um, that there are uh, contributions um, from your genes and from, uh, yeah, from your genes um, to things that will ultimately become your personality. So, um, you know, the, the behaviorists um, seem to not, not keep track of that. Um, so building on the, the strict behaviorist theory um, came the social learning theories. And so these are the theories of Rotter and Bandura um, and the idea that um, there is more to it, right? That there is motivation, that there are thoughts, that we do have cognitions and that those guide our behaviors um, and that we should be studying humans and not just animals, that the animal model doesn't tell us everything that we need to know about humans and in particular about personality. Um, so a Rotter thought that um, the interesting place to look was um, the consequences of our actions. And so what did we expect to happen next when we did something? Um, and based on that, that guided our behavior. So again, we're talking about behavior and we're not necessarily talking about personality. Um, behavior is what personality does, um, but to put it all on the behavior um, suggests that there's not some underlying motive um, to do these kinds of things. So uh, Rotter tried to get to that um, and got closer to it, talked about locus of control, whether you um, assume that things happen to you or whether you believe that you have agency and that you direct in some ways the, the things that happen to you. So um, locus of control is not, I wouldn't say it's a super, um, well, I don't, you know, I, there's not a ton of current research on locus of control in my view. I'm in the field of personality psychology. Um, having said that, I should probably check that because I could be wrong, um, but I don't hear it come up a lot. So, um, you know, I think, I think it's an interesting theory. And if you're a behaviorist and if you uh, are working in areas where behaviorist theory is guiding your work, um, then I think these are things to focus on more. Um, that's not the case for me, and so I focus on it somewhat less than some of the other theories in the book. Um, Bandura, um, you probably remember from the Bobo doll experiment, um, observational learning, um, also self-efficacy, you know, the idea that people um, believe in themselves and that that drives their own behaviors. If you think that you can accomplish something, if you have a, a strong um, belief in your own self-efficacy and your, your ability to... to accomplish things, then you're more likely to try more things. And so that can also be the observed personality traits um, that we see and sort of, you know, you know, is there some underlying personality that's driving those traits or is the traits the only thing that we're, you know, are the, are the observable measures the only thing that we're interested in, you know, how you, uh, how you actually perform and the behaviors that you actually exhibit.
Um, in the book, um, it, you know, I think in a previous edition of the book, they spent more time talking about reciprocal determinism. And in this edition of the book, it ends up in the chapter summary, but not very much in the chapter. Um, but the, the idea behind reciprocal determinism is that, um, is that there's not just one thing that we're looking at. People aren't passive, that, um, that you as a person live in a particular behavior, in a particular environment and you engage in particular behaviors and your behaviors are both influenced by the environment and they influence the environment and your behaviors influence you as you are influencing your behaviors and enacting your behaviors. You're also um, influencing the environment by the things that you do. And so that whole cycle um, is not a one way cycle, but all of those uh, components are, are um, influencing each other. Um, then the chapter winds up with two theories. Um, one is caps and the other is beats. Um, the amount of real estate that's given to him in the book is relatively short, um, which I think is appropriate. Um, the cognitive affective personality system um, talked about these if-then contingencies. It was like, if you do this, you know, if you're in this situation, then you're going to act in this particular way. Um, and this is really the situationist view, right? That um, that it's more about the situation and less about the person when you're looking at these behaviors. And so um, when you think back to um, Mitchell and the situationist argument in, I think, chapter four, um, anyway, in the earlier part of the book, um, it should be reminiscent for you when you're looking at the CAPS, um, the CAPS model. And then the BEATS model is Carol Dweck. Um, Carol Dweck is the author of um, Growth and Fixed Mindsets um, and that research. Um, and she thought that, you know, there are these basic motivations that led to goals and um, that, you know, th there were elements of trust and elements of control and, you know, elements of your own self-esteem or your, your status, your perceived esteem in the eyes of others. Um, and that those were the kinds of things that were driving your behaviors and, um, and that your personality um, could be described in that way. Um, I would not say that either caps nor beats, caps or beats, um, are uh, models that I find particularly useful um, in the way that I think about personality, but I'll be very interested to see what you think after you read the chapter. Um, and then uh, I've got you know several things that we're going to do this week where you're going to reflect on um, some of what's in the chapter. So have a great week. Um, and next week we're going to be talking about the self, which is always interesting, um, starting with chapter 15. Thanks. Bye.